Section 4.7, we're going to look at isosceles and equilateral triangles and uh, starting to use them more for solving uh, e uh, any geometric problems and or uh, even in some proof writing. So um, just some vocabulary you need to be familiar with first. Um, legs, the legs of an isosceles triangle are the two congruent sides. Okay, so if I tell you that um, this triangle here is an isosceles triangle and I call this guy triangle A, B, C, and I mark it like this, well, then you'd say that um, A, B, and B, C are your two legs. The vertex angle is the angle formed by the legs. Okay, so in other words here, angle B would be your vertex angle. Uh, the base of an isosceles triangle is a side that's not a leg. So in other words, A, C here would be the base. And the base angles are the two angles that are at your base. And those two base angles uh, in an isosceles triangle actually happen to be congruent. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Okay, That's exactly what this theorem says. The base angles theorem says if two sides of a triangle are congruent, then the angles opposite them are congruent. Okay, So in other words, if you have an isosceles triangle, then the base angles are congruent. So angle B here would have to be congruent to angle C. Okay, And the converse of the base angles theorem simply says if the base angles are congruent, then that automatically means that this thing has to be an isosceles triangle. Okay, So you have the base angles theorem and the converse of the base angles theorem. Both mean, you know, they, they just go back and forth. That's all. One says one thing, and then one just looks at the converse of it. So um, the corollary to it, okay, in other words, in addition to the base angles theorem, we have another one um, that says if a triangle is equilateral, then by rule it has to be equiangular. And if you flip that around and you look at the converse of that statement, if a triangle is equiangular, then it must be equilateral. So you know, long story short, just know that equilateral and equiangular go hand in hand with each other. And you probably already knew that, but just in case you didn't. So it says name two congruent angles in the in the triangle here. I'm just going to mark them. Okay, so because these two sides are congruent, the angles across from them are congruent to each other. So angle G and angle F there would have to be congruent angles because they're the base angles. Okay, example two says find the measures of angle R, S, and T. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. This thing is clearly an equilateral triangle, therefore it's equiangular. And although we haven't shown this yet, I think it makes sense. If we call each angle there x, then we have x plus x plus x equals 180. That says that 3x equals 180. And when I divide both sides by 3, that says that the measure of each angle is 60 degrees. Okay, so um, in an equilateral triangle, the angle measures will always be 60 degrees. Example three here, I know we're cruising along, but this stuff should be pretty basic, pretty straightforward. It says find the unknown values in the diagram. Okay, so um, part A, we're going to fly through most of these because it's going to be pretty quick. Um, part A, it's obviously an equal angular triangle, therefore it must be equilateral. Part B, it's an isosceles triangle, therefore the base angles must be congruent. By the, okay, part C. Um, it's an equilateral triangle, therefore we know it's equiangular. So you could do it a few ways. You could say if that's 5x, then this is 5x, and this is 5x, add them up, set them equal to 180. Or, like we just saw in the previous slide, we know that the, each angle in an equilateral triangle has to be 60. And when I divide 60 by 5, that tells me that the value of x here has to be 12. Part D. All right, part D, um, so I have a couple of uh, isosceles triangles, it looks like here. And really, actually, I take that back. The big one here, I, the, the good thing about this is I can outline it in different colors. So the big guy here is, equi uh, is equilateral because it's, all, it's obviously equiangular. So that automatically means that if this side's 8, this side X has to be 8. And then if I look at the smaller triangle here, that guy is marked so that it's isosceles. All right, and so that means that the, the legs have to be congruent. So 2y has to be the same as 8. Divide both sides by 2, y equals 4. So y is 4 and x is 8 there in part D. Part E, again, if that's 60 and that's 60, that means this thing's an equilateral triangle because by rule, by the triangle sum theorem, really, that angle's got to be 60 as well. And so you have 2x minus 3 equals 7. Add your 3. 2x equals 10 divided by 2 tells you that the value of x here has to be 5. 
And then in part F, again, it's an equal, uh, I'm sorry, it's not equilateral, it's an isosceles triangle. So because these base angles are congruent, the sides across from them are congruent. So 9x minus 8 equals 28. And then you just use your algebra. Solve for x. 9x equals 36. Divide by 9. x equals 4. Okay, so again, those, those are just some examples of how, and, uh, how we're going to apply isosceles and equilateral triangles. Okay, in example four, it says the pattern, uh, it says at the right, but obviously it's below, is uh, present in a quilt. Explain why ADC is equilateral. Okay, so triangle ADC. Why does that thing have to be equilateral? And the argument is this. Well, it's clearly isosceles because it's marked. Okay, and so what that means is that the base angles must be congruent. All right, and if the base angle is congruent, and we already know that this third angle, the vertex angle, was congruent to this angle to begin with, well, then the, the easy explanation here is we can show, and I'm not going to write this out, but I'm just going to talk you through it. We can show that this triangle is equiangular, and we know now that if a triangle is equiangular, that by rule means it must be equilateral as well. Okay, the second part says show that triangle CBA is congruent to triangle ADC. All right, and so um, as I go through this, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to write a flowchart proof, okay? And the way I'm going to prove this is I'm just going to go ahead and use, um, let's go ahead and use, um, we can just use angle side angles, fine. It won't matter. You can use actually pretty much any of them. And so what I have here, um, I know I can show right away that um, angle, uh, let's see here. I want to make sure I, I line up my corresponding pieces. It's really not going to matter because it's equilateral, so they're going to be interchangeable. But I'm going to go ahead and, and be careful here anyway. So I'm going to say that, uh, let's see here, ADC, CBA. So I'm going to say angle BCA, this angle here, has got to be, and I should have given myself a lot more room here. I don't know what I was thinking, is congruent to, um, and if I said BCA, then I'm going to want to say um, DAC. Okay, and all I'm going to say there is, um, actually, I can't even say definition of congruent angles because I'd have to show they have the same measure. So I'm just going to say given, okay? Because the diagram, let me erase. I, I know I made a lot of marks here in the diagram. Um, the diagram already had that marked for us. Okay, so they gave us that information. All right. Um, the second part I can say really quick now is that A C is congruent to CA, that's the reflexive property, okay, and so now what I can say, alright, so I've shown that, I've shown this, um, so now what we'll look at is we'll say, okay, now we got to do a little bit of legwork here now, okay, and um, what we're going to have to say is that uh, angle B, right, angle B is congruent to angle C. We can see that pretty pretty easily, okay? So there's a little bit of legwork here. So um, this is all. This would all have to go in your proof, and the way I would put it in a flowchart proof is like this. I would say angle B congruent to angle C. That's the base angles theorem, okay? Um, again, the base angles theorem says if, if we know those things isosceles, then the base angles have to be congruent. So B is congruent to C. Over here, we already said that C was congruent to the A in the other diagram. So now by rule, I can say, okay, so now angle B is congruent to angle, I'm going to be a um, DAC, trans property. Okay, so transitive property. And... Once I've shown that, we showed earlier that A and this angle were congruent. So now I can go ahead and say uh, that angle, let's see here, where am I at? Angle BAC is congruent to uh, angle ACD. And the reason for that is if I've proven, so we already know all of this. Right? Here's what we do know. We know all this is marked, this is marked, this is marked, this is marked. So we know all of that information right now. 
Um, and the only other thing I can say now is that angle BAC is congruent to angle ACD by third angle's theorem. And then once I've shown all that, now I can say this. I can say the triangles are congruent because of ASA. Now, clearly that proof isn't uh, the most straightforward proof in the world, but uh, nonetheless, it's something that you should be able to understand using uh, isosceles triangles. So, uh, in example five, uh, if <clears throat> part A, if we know that FH is congruent to FJ, uh, then what does that mean? So, in other words, I know that FH, that whole length, is congruent to that whole length which means then that this entire big triangle is an isosceles triangle. Therefore, angle H and angle J have to be congruent because they are the base angles. Part B says if uh, triangle FGK is equiangular and FG is 15, then GK equals blank. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. That's got to be 15. Again, it goes back to the idea that equiangular triangles are also equilateral. Um, so again, just... Uh, this section just focuses on primarily using isosceles tri uh, triangles as well as equilateral. So just knowing the different characteristics of each and how to apply them to a given diagram is kind of what we're looking for through this section.